Hello everybody and welcome to today's course all about indoor air quality and healthy building certifications. This course is developed by Kaitera and it's really an in-depth look at IAQ healthy building certifications and what are the requirements, the guidelines, and how IAQ really fits into these certifications. This is very in-depth and uh, hopefully it will be extremely educational and interesting. Quick self-introduction, my name is Liam Bates. I'm the CEO and co-founder at uh, Kaitera. I'm also an advisor for the Well Building Standards Air Concept, as well as the Performance Rating. I'm, I'm very passionate about everything indoor air quality and very excited to walk you through this, this in-depth journey into IAQ and healthy buildings. So what is on the agenda today? We will start with a, a quick overview of indoor air quality. What is IAQ? Uh, what are some of the key parameters? And then discuss the impact of IAQ on the, the human experience, the occupant experience, uh, especially within the workplace. Third part, which is really the meat of this, is how IAQ ties into healthy building certifications, the requirements, the guidelines, etc. Finally, we will talk a little bit about how to develop a, a data-driven strategy to measuring and starting to understand IAQ uh, within, within the built environment. Okay, what is indoor air quality? Why does it matter? What are some of the key metrics and what, what is the impact of indoor or outdoor air quality on us? So here are some key stats to start with. Every day we breathe between two and 3,000 gallons of air. To put that into con sort of context, that is a, a small swimming pool or a very, very large hot tub worth of air. So you can just sort of imagine that for a moment. Imagine every day drinking all of the water within a swimming pool. That's the amount of water that, that would be passing through your body. And that is the amount of air that we breathe every day. So it's a huge amount. It is something that we are doing every single minute of our entire lives. We are constantly breathing and we can go for several days without water, but we can only go for a few minutes without air. So it's, it's vital to us. We're doing it all the time. And there's a lot of it that goes through us. Now, just like you wouldn't want to drink a swimming pool that is filled with pesticide, you don't want to be breathing air that is filled with dangerous chemicals that can have a negative impact on, on your body. <clears throat> What is the impact of this? Well, according to the WHO, air pollution, air pollution leads to about 7 million premature deaths every year. That is an extremely high number, and it's something that we should definitely be concerned about. Around half of those are due to indoor air pollution, the other, the other half being due to air pollution that originated outdoors. Uh, so indoor air quality is, is hugely important. And the reality is that we spend about 90% of our time indoors. IEQ, negative IEQ has uh, health impacts both for the short term, so just just feeling bad, uh, having headaches, coughing, uh, sore throat, all of, all of these different symptoms that can come from uh, short term so impact of IEQ, but also it can have a lot of serious uh, long term impacts on our health. So indoor air quality is is of course referring to the air inside of our buildings. And what are some of the things that we care about? when we are talking about indoor air quality. Um, there are a variety of different parameters um, and they will vary a little bit or how common they are will vary based upon things like geography. Some parts of the world um, will have higher levels of outdoor uh, particulate matter, which can seep into the building and cause problems. Uh, some places due to construction materials used might have higher levels of chemicals, but here are some of the key parameters. So particulate matter, these are, these sort of fine particles in the air, uh, VOCs, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, ozone, nitrogen, nitrogen dioxide, and radon. These are some of the key parameters that uh, are typically measured. And out of these, there are a few that are, I would say, more important, uh, more common, and important to measure than others. If you had to go for three, typically these are the three indoor air quality parameters that you want to measure. One of these would be particulate matter. And so this is, as I was saying, really fine particles, physical objects, essentially, in the air. So think of this as, as dust, but potentially extremely fine. We hear sometimes PM 2.5, PM 10. This is referring to different sizes of particles, but they're all very, 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 very small and not very good for us. They're so small that they can get deep into our, um, 
into our lungs and then from there potentially into our bloodstream. TVOC or total volatile organic compounds. Uh, some of these have odors, some don't. These are uh, what we would typically think of as sort of chemical compounds that might exist within the built environment, maybe due to construction materials, due to paint or glue, and um, they have severe consequences both in the short and potentially long term. CO2 is something that we're all very familiar with. We're, we are breathing out CO2 all the time, but high levels of CO2 can cause fatigue, headaches, drowsiness, and just that general feeling of being in a meeting room and you, you just want to get out of the meeting room because it doesn't feel good. There's too many people and not enough fresh air. Often when we have that feeling of not enough fresh air, it, it doesn't mean that we actually need more oxygen. It means that in the air, there are uh, some of these pollutants namely CO2 as well as TVOC that are causing us to feel like we need fresh air. So every project, every country, every building is different, but these are generally key parameters to start with. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about the key parameters to measure. What is the impact of these? What, what is the impact of IAQ and potentially negative IAQ in the workplace. Plenty of research has been done on this topic over the years. Um, the, the impact of IAQ on human beings, one of the most significant or I'd say influential uh, studies was conducted by Dr. Joseph Allen at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And the study used a series of surveys and testing methods to measure the performance of um, people within the workplace under different air quality conditions. And the study pointed to a significant decrease in cognitive performance when there was a, uh, a decrease in air quality, so inferior air quality. And specifically some of the numbers there, you can see there was a, um, when you had a 500 microgram per cubic meter increase in VOCs, then cognitive scores decreased by 13%. Uh, and the, the point underneath is, is kind of the, the counter to that. 61% higher uh, cognitive scores on days when there was fresher air. And similarly, so when, when VOCs go up, cognitive performance comes down. And similarly, when CO2 levels go up, in this case, for every 400 ppm increase in CO2, uh, cognitive function dropped by 21%. So these are large numbers, especially when you consider that levels far higher than 400 ppm are often unfortunately seen in the workplace. Uh, so in this case, the, the research has pointed to a 21% um, decrease with every 400 ppm, but I will regularly see uh, workplaces where levels are potentially one or even 2000 ppm above recommended levels. So uh, that, that is a major impact on the um, cognitive performance of the people inside those spaces. Now, not only is this creating an impact on the, the say, the, the performance of the people, but this can also be uh, converted into a potential dollar amount and the impact on business. And that's what you see on the right side of uh, this slide here, which is the translation to monetary impact. So this particular study estimated that this change in performance from having improved air quality, so from better ha having better air quality, so it'd be equivalent to... Uh, an increase in $6,500 of salary per person per year. And I should point out that this is really just the productivity change per person. This is not accounting for any of the chain, the, the impacts, so the secondary impacts of poor IAQ, such as having to deal with complaints of employees that are uh, dealing with uh, poor air quality, compromised health, increased sick days, um, or even just the challenges of retaining talent over the long term in a potentially not optimal indoor working environment. And speaking about talent uh, retention and attraction, this is in a, a study from uh, Honeywell in 2022, 62% of global workers said they would leave their job if their employer failed to create a healthier indoor environment. So this is a major trend that we are seeing, that we have been seeing over the, the past few years there is a real demand to have uh, a positive indoor healthy environment. 
And 65% of those who had returned to in-person work, this is after the pandemic, told researchers that they found it very or extremely important to be informed of the state of air quality in their buildings. So the benefits of improved IAQ uh, in the workplace, you are going to have higher productivity, reduced complaints, reduced sick days. Uh, it is absolutely essential for encouraging a return to work, a return to the office as a lot of people have uh, gotten used to working at home. The office is really an opportunity to say this is a healthy workplace. It's a positive environment um, and to really create some uh, a location that people are happy and excited to go to. And of course, this is um, incredibly important for both attracting and retaining talent. Understanding IAQ requirements in building certifications. This is the meat of the presentation. We've talked about why IAQ is important. And um, now we're going to really get into the three main building standards when it comes to IAQ. That is well, lead, and reset. So let's take a look, first of all, at the well building standard and specifically within that, the air concept. So the well building standard was established by the IWBI, the International Well Building Institute, and the goal is really to advance health and wellness through a transformation of the built environment. Uh, the, there have been a few iterations of the, the well building standard, starting from V1, then there was a V2 pilot, and now we are officially in, in well V2. Within well, there are 10 uh, concepts, as they're called, uh, which you can see here, air, water, nourishment, light, movement, thermal comfort, sound, materials, mind, and community. And each of these has a combination of prerequisites and then optimizations that will give you more points. Uh, and I should note that uh, there, as I mentioned, there's well V1, then the V2 pilot, and then the official V2. There are also updates almost every quarter, if not every quarter, to the standard. So these, uh, the details of this can change somewhat over time uh, as, the con as, as the standard really evolves and um, continues to grow to match the needs of the market, new technology, and uh, new scientific evidence. So the air concept is the, the first out of the 10 concepts, and um, it is absolutely key to achieving well certification. If you do not tick these boxes and have a good indoor uh, healthy environment from an air quality perspective, it is impossible to achieve the well building standard. Uh, here you can see a list of all of the prerequisites as well as the optimizations under the air quality, uh, the air concept. And the ones that are highlighted here are uh, the ones that can be achieved by using sensor data. So there are different ways that you can uh, achieve some of these some of these features, and these might be from sensor data from continuous monitors. It might be from uh, somebody coming in and uh, taking a, a reading on site, so a performance test. It might be from letters of assurance from engineers, etc. For the uh, purposes of this presentation, we'll be covering the features in here that can be achieved via sensor data. And there's quite a, a large number, as you can see. So starting from the top, and there's quite a lot of detail here, so I hope you're ready. Uh, the first concept, uh, is, or the first feature is A01, and this is really the air quality precondition. So what this is, is essentially the minimum standards that must be achieved for certain levels of these key pollutants that are measured. And you'll see there's part one, part two, up to part five, including particulate matter, organic gases, inorganic gases, radon, uh, and then measurement. And I will not go through the details of absolutely every single row of every column uh, in this presentation. If you would like to just hit the pause button on the video, take a screenshot of this, and then you can come back to it later if you want to really understand the, the, the exact thresholds, because otherwise this will be a little bit of data overload. Uh, the, first, the first one, the first part is around particulate matter, and there are really three different options for the acceptable level of PM 2.5 and PM 10. 
first one that you see here, option one, is basically the, the standard minimum threshold. So for example, PM 2.5 must be under 15 micrograms per cubic meter. And this can be verified via sensor data. So if you have continuous indoor air quality monitors mounted within the space, all that you would need to do is get that data and show that the levels are under 15 micrograms per cubic meter. There are, there's a second and a third option, and these are modified and dynamic thresholds in uh, essentially highly polluted regions. So as an example, um, New Delhi has, at least in uh, around 2019, had an average PM 2.5 level of approximately 100 micrograms per cubic meter. Unfortunately, that is extremely high. And that makes it very, very, very challenging to achieve a level of uh, 15 micrograms per cubic meter or less. And so there are uh, modified thresholds for these high levels. So option two, for example, is um, where the an annual average outdoor PM 2.5 level is above 35 micrograms per cubic meter. And there the threshold will be slightly higher. So it's a little bit more lenient in these areas where otherwise it's extremely hard to achieve these targets. And option three is um, essentially just looking at a percentage decrease from outdoors. Again, this is for areas where the outdoor PM 2.5 levels are uh, just extremely high. And all of these are uh, verified by continuous sensor data. So part two of A01 is around organic gases. And so this would be your, your volatile organic compounds. And this can be achieved via performance test or again via continuous data from sensors installed in the space. So inorganic gases, and uh, it's, this is really the theme throughout for all of these, you can achieve this through a, a one-off sort of on-site performance test or through continuous monitoring. And uh, really this is looking at carbon monoxide as well as ozone. And the fourth part is for uh, radon. And again, it's the same, same general structure of sensor data. Um, the difference here is that there is an option of not actually measuring, so using a um, uh, essentially mechanical ventilation and using a letter of assurance from an engineer to show that the these areas are uh, will have sufficient ventilation to ensure that there uh, will not be high levels of radon. So this is this is a great option where uh, you don't need to necessarily have sensors. And finally, all these parameters will need to be measured. Uh, at least once per year. So well is not concerned about just sort of taking a box when the building is done and then never look at it again. There is a requirement to come back and measure these parameters at least once per year. So again, this is a great opportunity. If you do have continuous monitors within the space, uh, this, this box is essentially automatically checked. So this is a quick quick recap. Uh, this, this would be the one to grab a screenshot of if you want to use it later. Particulate matter, 15 micrograms per cubic meter uh, or lower of PM 2.5. For the organic uh, gases, you can use a total VOC reading of 500 micrograms per cubic meter or lower. Uh, carbon monoxide, 9 ppm or lower. Ozone, 51 ppb or lower. And uh, radon, again, you can use this reading here, or you can go with the mechanical ventilation option. So that, is, that was A01. A03 is focused on ventilation design. This is also a prerequisite. And there are a few different versions uh, and different options. So options one to three here are focused on the different guidelines such as ASHRAE 62.1 um, and just making sure that the building has been designed in a way that there will be sufficient ventilation. There's also the, the option four that you see listed here, which is uh, simply by measuring CO2 levels and achieving uh, 900 ppm or less than this box can be ticked. So again, this is a great opportunity to use continuous monitors to simply look at the data and say, yep, this is good. Uh, the readings are being met. This prerequisite has been achieved. And then for, for A01, which was uh, the sort of basic levels of air quality, there's, there's also a, an enhanced version of that, which is A05. So enhanced air quality optimization 
is really about going above and beyond the minimum requirements. And this is where there is the opportunity to uh, get extra points. So you can see there are up to uh, four points available here for particulate matter, organic gases, and inorganic gases. Again, you might want to grab a screenshot of this. I won't go through it in, in all the detail here, um, but just as an example, the, the basic level for PM2.5 was 15 micrograms per cubic meter, but if you can achieve 10 micrograms per cubic meter or lower for PM2.5, then you will get two points um, for your well certification in, above the, the, the basic minimum. So all of these together can earn you up to four points. And at the end of this, uh, I'll talk about, you know, okay, what do these points actually mean and how much, how much is, is, is useful and how much is this really going to help you? And similar to how we had the enhanced air quality requirements, there is also the opportunity here to have the um, A06, which is enhanced ventilation design, which is really going, again, above and beyond uh, the minimum requirements for ventilation design. And I think the, the, the one that I'd, again, you know, feel free to grab a screenshot, but the one that I would bring everyone's attention to here is uh, that by having, by measuring lower levels of CO2, you're able to uh, gain more points. So we'll see here, option four is ventilation monitoring. So uh, if you see there, one of the following carbon dioxide thresholds is met in occupiable spaces, 750 ppm or less, will give you two points. So while the, uh, the original level was set at 900, if you can hit 750 as evidenced by sensor data, then that's an extra two points. Uh, in, in, in total, there are um, potentially three, three points here that can be uh, achieved. A08 is, is really all about continuous monitoring and sensor data. Uh, this one is air quality monitoring and awareness optimization. And there are uh, two points available here. There's really two components. One is installing indoor air quality monitors. So putting air quality monitors on the wall and collecting the data about how the space is performing. And the second component is about promoting air quality awareness and uh, sharing that information. So as you'll see here, uh, monitors need to measure at least three of the, the, the parameters below, which typically would be PM 2.5, carbon dioxide, as well as TVOC, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. These are the, the key parameters that we recommend to always be measuring inside an indoor environment. And the, uh, the second part of this is air quality metrics that are measured are also presented on display screens or via a web app or a phone application so that occupants can see it. And occupants can also start to understand the importance of air quality and you, you know that this is a high performing space where they have good air. So this is, this is also a great opportunity, I think, well standards aside, it's a great opportunity to share the work that a building is doing uh, with the occupants. So, and again, if, if, they're, if you're installing uh, an air quality monitor such as the Sense Edge, which actually has a display on it, then there's an opportunity here to sort of hit two birds with one stone. So some of the key takeaways when it comes to the air concept in the well building standard, air is really critical to achieving the certification. It's, it's, the, it's the first concept and hitting the prerequisites is just a, a, well, a prerequisite to achieving well certification. Uh, via the air concept, there are potential 18 points that can be achieved and through the use of continuous monitors and sensors, uh, you can achieve about seven points that we just went through. So seven points, which is going from A01, A03, A05, A06, and A08. That's the prerequisites in the seven points. Uh, and it's also important to mention that there is a thermal comfort uh, concept within well, and the use of continuous monitors will also help you to achieve, I believe, three extra points with thermal comfort. So really you're looking at 10 points and what does this mean? If you look at the different levels of well certification, starting from bronze, going up to platinum, 10 points is really the difference between silver and gold. So 
using sensor data and, and continuous monitoring through IoT devices is really a, a sort of a one-stop solution to be able to go from silver to gold level or to go from gold halfway to platinum uh, just through this one piece of technology. Talked about well, next we will be going into LEED certification and specifically focused on IEQ, so indoor environmental quality. Uh, LEED, which stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, is a green building certification program that, that recognizes and promotes buildings that uh, achieve certain standards for environmental performance and sustainability and um, green performance. It's developed by the USGBC, and it's one of the most widely recognized and one of the most widely used building standards in the world. Similar to well, it is based upon a, a point system, and there are a lot of different flavors of lead, for lack of a better term. Uh, different standards for new buildings, existing buildings, uh, retail, schools, offices. So there, there are a lot of different variations of this. Um, and we'll be looking at a, a, a couple of these today. So uh, primarily focused on existing building, uh, existing buildings. So what you will see here, there is uh, a, a there's a number of categories, and then within those there are subcategories. So these are the the categories that you you still, you'll see here on the right, and one of those is indoor environmental quality. Now within indoor environmental quality, which is one of the seven core categories. Uh, there are a number of subcategories. So here we're looking at O and M, and there are a number of prerequisites, uh, and one of those is the indoor environmental quality performance, for which there are up to uh, 20 credits available. So that's what we're going to uh, jump into right now, is this indoor environmental quality performance. This is a prerequisite, and then up to, qu up to 20 credits available. So O and M projects need to... Uh, use an annual survey and then an annual air test and combine those scores to come up with a human experience score. And I think this is a really interesting approach. Um, it's it's combining both the sort of the, the the data driven from actual sensors as well as the the human experience. And this is this is quite important because humans in many ways are good sensors, but we're also very bad sensors. So if a room is too hot or too cold, we know immediately. But if a room has levels of PM 2.5 that are too high, we don't necessarily know. So I'm a big fan of, of this approach of combining the sort of two different data sets together, the subjective and the objective, to create an overall human experience score. That score, 50% of it is coming from the satisfaction survey, and the other half is coming from the sensor data. Uh, in this case, it's a combination of CO2 and TVOC. Now, based upon your total score, you will be getting anywhere from uh, eight credits, which is sort of the minimum requirement, up to 20 credits for this subcategory. Now, how are these calculated? The CO2 score is uh, essentially rating the building's CO2 levels. It's looking at the 95th percentile, um, and, you, and, and it's measured against the benchmark of 1,000 ppm. So based on this, there will be a score, which is from 1 to 100, saying, how was your CO2 performance? The lower the CO2 levels, the higher the score. Uh, TVOC is the exact same thing. Uh, the, the industry benchmark that is used is 500 micrograms per cubic meter. And yet, the lower the VOC numbers, the higher the score, the better you've done. Okay, so within LEED, there is also BD and C as well as ID and C. And uh, this will have slightly different requirements. And again, feel free to pause and take screenshots at any point in time because there's a lot of information on all these slides. I will not read everything on the slides in the interests of time. So again, here there are prerequisites as well as uh, essentially enhancements or optimization for extra credits. You'll see there's minimum air quality performance as well as enhanced indoor air quality strategies and the indoor air quality assessment. So if we look at the minimum indoor air quality performance prerequisite, it is really exactly what the name says it is, which is it is a minimum 
sort of basic level to ensure that the building is providing the occupants with a relatively safe level of indoor air quality. Uh, it is not necessarily pushing the limits of what can be achieved and ensuring that this is the most optimized, healthy building for occupants uh, available. So it's it's more of a minimum minimum standard. And um, the, the one note that I would make on, on this particular slide is on the right side, number three, there is, the, again, the possibility to use um, real-time monitoring of CO2 within each thermal zone to uh, achieve a uh, portion of this prerequisite. Okay, so the next the uh, credit here is for enhanced indoor air quality strategies. And this is optional and really allows building projects to earn additional points within LEED by implementing strategies that go above and beyond the absolute minimum that we just, uh, just discussed. So uh, to comply with this and, and achieve this, uh, a, a project will need to achieve at least three strategies, which will give them one point, or uh, six strategies, which will give them two points. Now, what are these strategies? There are, again, a number here. I will not go through all of them because there's a lot of detail here. But the two that I would draw your attention to that can be achieved through the use of continuous indoor air quality monitoring would be strategy number nine and strategy number 10. So strategy nine is carbon dioxide monitoring. So through measuring uh, CO2 levels, you can achieve this strategy. And this is about having CO2 monitors in uh, regularly occupied, densely occupied areas located uh, between three and six feet. So within the, the, the breathing zone. And one point worth noting is that these CO2 monitors need to have either uh, an audible, uh, a visual alarm or a connection to the building management system. And the intent here is really that when CO2 levels are too high, somebody can find out and somebody can do something about it. Strategy number 10 is uh, additional source control and monitoring. And uh, so this is sort of going above and beyond the CO2 monitoring. So in spaces where you are likely to find other indoor air pollutants, you need to monitor and uh, evaluate the potential sources for those contaminants. Uh, so it's it's not just about monitoring. Uh, also need to develop and implement a plan for handling those sources to actually uh, come up with uh, optimizations to uh, ultimately resolve them. That's 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 really the goal of of this strategy number ten. Okay, indoor air quality assessment. Uh, this is another opportunity to earn points when it comes to indoor air quality. And again, the goal is really to establish better indoor air quality uh, once construction is complete and then during the, the occupancy uh, phase. So there are two different options to achieve this. So option one is flush out, which is basically just flush the, the building out and try to reduce uh, contaminants that might be inside. Option number two is air testing. This this is can be one to two points. Uh, I am a huge believer in option number two. Uh, flushing a building out definitely is a, is a great thing to do because there can be a lot of contaminants inside. But the problem is that our buildings are not they're not sort of one and done. You don't finish the building, flush it out, and then it stays that way forever. The reality is that once buildings are occupied, um, all sorts of things can happen. And even when the buildings aren't occupied they will not always remain in a flushed out state. So levels of contaminants can naturally increase within the space. So what we should really be looking at is what are the contaminant levels during a typical level of occupation, not what are the contaminant levels right after we flushed out the building and we've cleaned everything out of it. So option number two for, for error testing, uh, one point is awarded for particulate matter and um, uh, as well as inorganic gases. And then uh, another another point is for VOCs. So the, the first point for PM and inorganic gases, you can see here, there are uh, thresholds. Again, feel free to take a screenshot. Uh, I think a, a point worth noting is that across well, lead, and reset, 
the thresholds are generally quite similar. So if we, again, just take PM2.5 as the example here, here we're looking at 12 micrograms per cubic meter versus uh, 15 for well, or if you're going after the enhanced strategies, enhanced air quality in well, uh, there's one point for, 15, for 12 micrograms and one point for 10 micrograms. So generally, we're still looking at the same types of thresholds across all of these standards, actually. Okay, and the, uh, so that was the first point, uh, the first credit, and the second is for uh, measuring and um, ticking the boxes for VOCs. Uh, the initial reading can be TVOC, and if TVOC levels exceed 500 micrograms per cubic meter, uh, then need to correct any identified issues and then run the tests again. Um, additionally, I want to test for individual VOCs. That's what you see on the list here on the right. I will not read those out in, in uh, one by one. But basically, you are you will want to um, test for test for these and make sure that concentrations uh, are not exceeded here. So key takeaways for lead. So number one is. Um, the subcategory can help you earn up to 20 credits when it comes to O&M. And again, 50% of that is coming from the survey and 50% is coming from a combination of CO2 and TVOC measuring. Uh, there are several EQ credits and prerequisites that are tied to air quality and IAQ and measuring and improving your IAQ can contribute to lead credits in BD and C as well as ID and C projects. You can get up to six additional credits by, by doing this. Again, feel free to take a screenshot. We have the, the uh, exact prerequisites, prerequisites and credits listed on this slide. Finally, we will take a look at reset certification. Uh, reset, again, has a couple flavors. There's commercial interiors as well as core and shell. And we'll go through both of these in some detail. So what is RESET? RESET is a modular green building standard that emphasizes the health of occupants within the built environment. What is, I think, really unique about RESET is that it is completely sensor and performance driven. So it's, while well and lead might have aspects that are uh, where sensor readings will be taken and submitted, RESET sensor readings are the absolute foundation of the standard and those sensor readings actually need to be provided to reset almost in real time so that's very different to um something like well where at the end of the year you might take all those readings submit them calculate a 95th percent percentile reading for example and then say pass fail reset this is a continuous process and it's really built into the standard as as you will see shortly uh, so there are a number of different um, modules within RESET, so materials, air, water, energy, circularity. We will be talking about RESET air. So the requirements. RESET was developed with a clear understanding that air quality needs to be continuously monitored. And it isn't, as I was saying earlier, one and done. It's not a measurement that you take after the building has been completed and then you never look at it again. It is a... It, Air quality changes over time, it changes with occupancy, it changes with user or occupant behavior within the space. And so taking a one-off reading really is not sufficient. Uh, it can, again, it can change with the seasonality, all sorts of things. And so reset requires constant measurement and constant measurement of the, the following parameters. So there's particulate matter, TVOC, CO2, temperature, and relative humidity. So, as I mentioned earlier, there's commercial interiors and corn shell. So for commercial interiors, there are two levels of performance that can be achieved. Uh, there is the acceptable level, and then there is the high performance. And again, uh, you know, take, take a screenshot of this if you'd like to. I won't read through everything. Um, the... Well, I guess at a, at a very high level, um, you know, PM 2.5, for example, is under 35 micrograms per cubic meter. TVOC under 500 
micrograms per cubic meter, CO2 is under 1000 ppm. And the, the interesting thing here is that temperature and humidity, there are no requirements for what the acceptable levels are, but you do need to measure it. Um, and yeah, that's, that's quite interesting here. The high performance thresholds are, are quite a bit stricter especially for PM 2.5 and CO2. So high performance for PM 2.5 is under 12 micrograms. Uh, so that's, you know, more than sort of, you know, an over 50% uh, decrease as compared to the acceptable level. And CO2 is going from 1000 down to 600 ppm. 600 ppm is quite a low level of CO2. So these are definitely high performance uh, thresholds. And if these levels can be achieved in the space, I think it really is a you know, a big stamp of approval to say this space truly is performing well and you can be confident about the indoor air qualities uh, within this space. A corn shell have slightly different requirements, which you'll see listed in the table here. I think the, the probably the biggest uh, difference is that particulate matter can be depending on the situation can be looked at as a reduction of outdoor air uh, or so really what what corn shell is is looking at fundamentally is what is the quality of the air that is being delivered into the occupied spaces so if outdoor air quality is 100 micrograms per cubic meter then the air that is being delivered through the air handling units and through the supply duct into the space uh, must have a decrease of at least 75%. So the level must be 25 micrograms per cubic meter or lower. Now, one of the big differences with RESET is that um, RESET is not just a standard for buildings. It's really a standard almost end-to-end -end for, the, for the entire technology solution. And this is, this is very unique within building certifications. So RESET actually requires monitors to be accredited by RESET. And I think this is, this is a, really, a really great uh, and really key point to the certification that makes it stand out. So RESET requires monitoring of all reg regularly occupied spaces and the monitors need to be submitted to RESET. RESET will, um, will actually test these monitors or test them th through or with a third party. So going through a full series of uh, tests in a lab setting and then accredit the device as saying, yes, it performs at the required level of accuracy, the required level of precision. And this is an instrument that can be relied upon to output high quality readings. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of air quality monitors on the market that do not necessarily do what it says on the box. Uh, there are a lot of monitors that have been developed for consumer use that are not necessarily suitable for use in a building or in a commercial environment. So uh, RESET actually certifies these monitors and only approved monitors can be used for RESET building certification. Uh, there are different grades of monitor that RESET will certify and only a grade A or grade B RESET accredited monitor can be used for a RESET certified building. There are, are also strict requirements and criteria about how monitors can be installed within the space. So, for example, they need to be wall mounted, they need to be centrally located, they need to be mounted within the breathing zone, which is three to uh, six feet above ground, 900 to, or I'd say 90 centimeters to 1.8 meters uh, from the ground and they need to be located at least five meters away or 16 feet away from operable windows, as well as air filters, um, air diffusers coming directly from the air handling unit. So really this is trying to make sure that the, the monitors are capturing readings that are representative of the space in which the occupants are staying. Uh, and it's also recommended that they are hardwired. So as I was saying earlier, reset is really all about capturing continuous readings and using all of that data. So it's important that the data isn't lost. The device doesn't disconnect from the network and stop transferring data, etc. And as I was mentioning earlier, this is really an end-to-end -end certification. It's not just the building, it's the entire monitoring technology stack. So not only do you need to have a reset certified monitor, um, projects need to submit their data to a reset 
approved or reset certified cloud. And uh, that cloud will verify that all indoor air quality performance targets were met. So there will be uh, daily averages, uh, constant uh, readings sent up to the cloud. And um, it's, yeah, it's, it's not just at the end of the year, here is a giant uh, CSV or Excel file with all of your readings for the past year. It's continuous and it, the air quality needs to be maintained at a high level in order to maintain the certification. So again, it's not just one and done. Key takeaways. Uh, Reset Air places a big emphasis on continuous monitoring, real-time monitoring, real-time reporting, and uh, PM 2.5, CO2, TVOC, temperature, and humidity. And in some areas, carbon monoxide. These are all parameters that need to be measured. Uh, monitors need to be certified by uh, Reset. Only grade A and grade B is acceptable, and uh, the cloud uh, solution also needs to be accredited. And again, monitors... There's a whole bunch of standards around how they're how they're actually installed. So we will wrap up with a quick quick look at data driven strategies for achieving IQ requirements. Um, wh what are the steps to go from I want to measure indoor air quality to actually having a strategy to put this in place and to ultimately improve your indoor air quality? So it wouldn't be a presentation on IAQ and data if we did not uh, have this quote on the screen, what gets measured gets managed. Uh, it, is, it is really true. The only way to improve indoor air quality and to ensure that a space has optimal indoor air quality is to measure it. How do we measure it? So here's what we used to do, <laughs> which is have somebody walk around the building, maybe once a year, maybe once every six months, um, typically a, a third-party consultant with a device like you see in this, in this image um, and potentially a notebook in the other hand. And take, take a measurement of the building and uh, write it down in the notebook. And I, I've seen this many, many times. I'm not exaggerating. Someone walking around with a notebook in hand, writing down 67.13 and then going to the next place and doing the same thing. Uh, this is great when... This is a big step up from not measuring indoor air quality, but this is extremely an extremely outdated approach at this point. Uh, there are a lot of problems with this. Number one is that you are getting a one-time measurement. Uh, the, the level of CO2 on Tuesday might be completely different from the level of CO2 on Friday, which might be totally different from the level of CO2 in December or March, or when the conference room is occupied or not occupied. And having one single data point makes it almost impossible to make any sense out of that data. There's also an issue of, of location. Uh, you can't measure every location at the same time. So you might see a high level of CO2 in one room and then a low level of CO2 in another, but is it that the, the location is different or is it that the timing was different or is it that the room was being used in a different way? So it's very hard to make sense of this data and get any further than saying generally is does the building seem to be good or bad? And even that there's a lot of question marks and uncertainty in in even coming to that outcome, just based on the absolute massive lack of data. This also doesn't allow you to know what to do to fix a problem. So if there is a problem, the next question is going to be, what do I do about it? And where is this problem coming from? And unfortunately, due to the lack of data, it's almost impossible to have any idea if, a, a, if, if you're using data from a one-off spot check. And this is this is a you know a very good example. You can see this uh, on on this graph here, which is a, a courtesy of uh, the reset standard. Over time, levels can fluctuate up and down, and this is uh, as I mentioned earlier, the flushing out a building is great to remove all of the contaminants that might exist within that building. But as you can see, over time, the building will get occupied again, and then contaminants can can rise up. Now, if you take a building, uh, sorry, if you take a reading during the flushed out phase everything might look great, but if you take another reading once the building is occupied, it might look very different and you might have a very unhealthy indoor environment. But unfortunately, that's the time we actually care about, which is when the occupants are in the building. So it's important to, to take measurements at the right time and to take enough measurements to understand what is, what is actually going on. And I'd say the, the, the reverse also exists. I've seen projects where um, 
buildings would fail their certification, for example, well certification, this is a real example, because at the time of um, when they were, and these, this was a building that opted to go with um, a spot check rather than using continuous monitoring. And at the time of the spot check, there happened to be construction going on down the road. And we've all experienced that, that situation where you are in a, you're in a building and you go, oh, it's like, it smells like renovation, but our building is not being renovated. And then you see that one block away, there's a building that's being uh, renovated or a road that's being paved and there's tar being put down. Then you can smell it for three, four or five blocks around. Uh, and that will definitely come up in the readings in your own building. Now, if that is the one day when you happen to be getting your spot check done for certification, uh, that's probably going to result in a failure. Whereas if you have the historical data, you'll be able to see, okay, this is this is nothing to do with us. Unfortunately, our air might be impacted by it, but this is a short-term uh, problem. So continuous monitoring, it's where the future is. Um, using sensors to measure data allows you to identify trends, understand problems. Is it one room? Is it one type of room? Is it a specific floor? Is it just CO2? Uh, being able to identify trends and problems unlocks the possibility to improve. Without this, it's almost impossible to make the right decisions about how to improve a space. Um, with, with continuous data, you are able to address concerns as they come up. So not just understand the trends, but also find out what, if there's a problem, exactly when that problem happens and not 11 months later when the next spot check happens to be taking place. So you know, this, this is, um, I, I'd say a huge win because the worst situation to find yourself in is where uh, you're dealing with occupant, occupant complaints and you have no idea what the problem is uh, because you're the last person to find out because there is no data on this. And finally, the ability to see long-term trends is 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 incredibly important. Um, so one, when lo once long-term trends become visible, then again, it's possible to uh, come up with strategies to improve any problems that might exist. And finally, the last thing here is is the the possibility of energy savings. So often, because we're not measuring the air in our buildings holistically enough, uh, buildings tend to go with strategies that can be overkill. So for example, just putting as much fresh air into the building as possible, because we know that fresh air is great for people and the more fresh air we can have, the better the people will be. And, and that's, that's great, but um, it, it's also easy to sort of go overkill and waste a lot of energy in the process. Um, ventilation is one of the biggest consumers of electricity. HVAC accounts for approximately 50% of HVAC consumption within buildings. And buildings account for a huge amount of the entire world's energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. So I think it's really important for us to, to find a sweet spot between making sure that our buildings are healthy for the people inside them, but that we're also not ventilating buildings that don't even have anyone in them. Or if, if CO2 levels are 500 in the building, maybe we can slow down the amount of fresh air that we're pumping into the building because the levels are already great. Um, so... By optimizing for these two things through real-time data, we can save energy, save money in the process, and have very happy uh, and healthy occupants, and of course, achieve our building certifications. Uh, so thank you for uh, sitting through this presentation. Hopefully this was uh, interesting, informative, and educational, and uh, yeah, I hope everybody has a, a great journey with their indoor air quality projects.